Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the Premier of Nova Scotia, Stephen McNeil, and Nova Scotia's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Robert Strang. Go ahead, Premier. Thank you, Chrissy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll ask Dr. Strang to give us an update on COVID-19 in Nova Scotia. Thank you, Premier, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, today I'm reporting one new case of COVID-19, which brings the total number of confirmed cases in Nova Scotia to 1,053, and that uh, this new case, uh, like uh, previously many of our cases, is associated with the ongoing Northwood uh, outbreak. Um, that is a resident at Northwood. And so with this addition at Northwood, we have 12 residents and four staff with active cases of COVID-19 uh, in this facility. This is the one long-term care home uh, that still has active cases of COVID-19. I just want to take a moment to, to, to uh, again thank all the staff uh, at Northwood who are and people from across the health system who have come to work in Northwood uh, to continue to provide care and support as they work to keep uh, residents safe and an on, and ongoing work to control the spread of this virus. Yesterday, the QE2 labs processed 533 tests. Uh, we currently have uh, seven individuals in hospital, three of those in the ICU. Uh, 975 people now ha have recovered from COVID-19. Um, and, and once again, I know that people watch the numbers very closely. Um, uh, as I've said before, we continue to update our case information uh, to, to uh, make sure it's accurate. And as part of this ongoing process, the number of recovered cases has been reduced uh, by one from 976 to 975. Just if people have questions about that. We have now uh, 39,441 people who have been tested for COVID-19 in Nova Scotia and have received negative results. Back to you, Premier. Uh, thank you, Dr. Strang. And, uh, Strang, and I'm uh, excited to talk to you about next steps. Uh, these steps are only made possible uh, because of your hard work, and I want to thank all Nova Scotians for continuing to follow uh, the advice of public health. Today, I'm announcing that parts of our economy are ready to restart. Effective June 5th, most businesses that were required to close under the public health order can reopen. Restaurants for dine in as well as takeout and delivery. Bars, wineries, distilleries and craft beer tap rooms. Hair salons, barber shops, spas, nail salons and tattoo parlors. Gyms and yoga studios. Some health providers can also reopen on June 5th. Dentistry and other self-regulated health professions including optometry, chiropractors, physiotherapists, unregulated health professionals like massage therapists, podiatry and naturopath have also been given the green light for June 5th, as well as veterinarians. We believe that we have found a balance between public safety and restarting our economy. We are still moving slowly, but that is a good, this is a good first step. We've considered feedback gathered through the consultation with businesses and associations. Dr. Strang and his team have been working to help them understand the protocols that they must follow as they reopen. I have every confidence that you can do this, and I have confidence that Nova Scotians will support you. Let's be clear, we will be monitoring the restart very closely from a public health point of view. And we will continue testing so that if there are any signs of the problem, we will be on it. We are still working, though, with our child care sector on a plan to reopen safely. We had hoped that this would be June 8th, but now it looks more like June 15th. We will share the official reopening date once the plan is fully approved. Our primary focus, though, will always be on the safety of our children, and we are not going to rush it. Now, of course, Every business, every sector that is about to reopen must also follow public health protocols. Isn't that right, Dr. String? Uh, correct, Premier, uh, and thank you. This is good news, uh, and I, I agree that finding a, a good balance between continuing to control COVID and, and, and the importantly reopening the economy in our society. And like you, I want to thank Nova Scotians for following the public health rules and the advice that which has helped us to uh, to uh, get through wave one, uh, minimizing the impact and, and, and be in a place now where we have a very flat curve. Um, all Nova Scotians have risen to this un unprecedented ch challenge and it's because of everybody's effort that we're able to be here today. 
uh, allowing businesses to reopen with modifications is, is an important way to help create our new normal as we continue to fight the virus that causes COVID-19. As the Premier said, businesses that have been required to close under the public health order can start opening as of June the 5th. They must all follow plans that ensure public health protocols are being met. Uh, and we're working with those businesses to make details of their protocols available for, uh, for the public to see. Key protocols are, are keeping the distance rule of two meters or six feet wherever possible uh, and, and staying within the, the, the numbers of, of limits for the number of people that can gather. These rules, important rules about numbers and distancing, uh, are, are critical to controlling COVID-19 and are here to stay for a significant length of time. Businesses, workplaces and other organizations need to find a way to respect the physical distance rule. If a business is too small to ensure the two meters distance between uh, customers or clients, then the gathering limit, of, uh, uh, which is now five, uh, applies. All businesses, workplaces and other organizations uh, also need to increase cleaning, especially high touch surfaces and washrooms, support increased hand washing, encourage mask use when appropriate, uh, and reminding and supporting people to stay home if they're unwell. Every business is different and, they, and there are many ways to meet these protocols. Uh, the sectors that I have met with have all had lots of really good questions and, and, and their own observations and we've had very productive discussions about how they can develop and imp implement reopening plans that make sense uh, for their, their business or their service they provide or their, 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 the presence they have in the community. I've been impressed with the comprehensive plans that I've received so far and the thinking that's gone into those plans. What that shows me that these sectors are taking the health of, of the, both their staff and the health of Nova Scotians very seriously. And it gives me confidence that we can uh, reopen while mitigating uh, the risks of COVID-19. Uh, we now have approved plans for several sectors. Uh, for example, I've approved plans for restaurants and cosmetology cosmetology uh, and there are two sectors that have a great deal of complexity uh, and as I said there have a lot of thought has gone into how they will operate safely. Many others have submitted plans that are in the process of being reviewed right now and still others are developing the plans with support from uh, Occupation Health and Safety and Public Health. Um, businesses that were not required to close under the public health all, all order also need to develop plans to reopen safely and meet public health requirements. This will help them operate safely and help them demonstrate to their employees and customers their commitment to, to safety. Any, for any business or organization that needs help developing a plan, there is now information on the website that was launched yesterday, novascotia.ca forward slash reopening Nova Scotia. All of the businesses are taking responsibility to ensure the public safety. Uh, at, at the same time, we know, I need to remind that, uh, in, that individual Nova Scotians, we also need to do our part. We also need to continue the personal, uh, practicing the personal uh, po protective measures. It, it, we have a role in making sure that, it, that we are maintaining social distances outside of our household or our household bubbles. That we are taking the responsibility to wash our hands frequently uh, or use hand sanitizer if there's no soap or water available. Practicing good cough etiquette, coughing or sneezing into the sleeve. And I know yesterday I coughed and I didn't, and that's my apologies. Um, uh, I make mistakes. Uh, it's important that people avoid touching their face, limiting non-essential travel. How do we play a role in making sure that the high-touch services, whether it's in our own personal workspace at work or at our homes, how making sure we're cleaning those? And, and we've got recommendations about uh, we encourage Nova Scotians to consider wearing a mask, a non-medical mask, when they may be in situations in the public when they be around other people and can't maintain the social distance. So all of us, along with businesses, all of us have, have, uh, have the responsibility and, and the opportunity to practice these. And it's a collect continuing this collective effort which will allow us to uh, reopen safely. Our new normal does mean modifications for all of us and how we live, work and play. This requires everyone's patience and thinking and working with a, with a focus on our, our, on our collective well-being. Businesses and organizations are modifying that the way that they operate and we ask all Nova Scotians to understand and respect the new normal and, uh, and also follow public health or continue to follow public health direction. 
And as I've said before, as we continue to do throughout this, and we continue into this new normal, I ask everybody to act with care for each other, with a sense of community and our collective well-being, and, and using common sense of how we interpret and apply all these rules. Uh, thank here. you very much, uh, Dr. Strang. We understand this has been difficult, and businesses are hurting, and reopening is challenging. Our government wants to offer some help. Today we are announcing a $25 million small business reopening support grant. This fund will provide eligible small businesses, not-for-profit, charities and social enterprises with a grant of up to $5,000. Many of you have to operate under entirely new conditions and maybe even change your business model. So along with the grant, we are offering a voucher worth $1,500 to access consulting services to offer you advice. This program is for those ordered to close under the public health order, along with small independent retailers, independent gas retailers, and dental clinics. If you receive the Small Business Impact Grant we announced in April, you do not need to apply. We will contact you directly. For everyone else, applications online June 1st. As well as the private sector gets ready to open, we understand as a government, we also have a role to play in getting people back to work. Today I am pleased to announce on behalf of our government an infrastructure investment of $230 million. This money will go towards more than 200 shovel-ready projects, including additional paving on 100 series highways, expansion of our gravel road program, replacement of bridges across our province, green energy projects, school repairs, waterfronts, small option homes, and provincial museum upgrades. These projects will provide, will support small and medium-sized construction companies across our province who will hire Nova Scotians to do that work. This investment will create some 2,000 jobs in this fiscal year. Tenders are being issued immediately. We'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up in the amount of time that we have today. First question will go to Global's Alicia Drous. Thank you. Um, my first question is just as we start to talk about stores and, and businesses reopening, um, a lot of people are just wondering, as some places are allowed to have, you know, 20 plus people inside a store, they're wondering why we still can't have social gatherings of more than five people and when those rules might change and when Nova Scotians might learn more about that plan. So and we have to understand that, uh, you know, we look at the businesses and the retail environment, uh, there, there are different dynamics. It's not just the number of people to get, that get together, but the type of activity that they're doing uh, and the settings. And, and so social settings have very different dynamics. Uh, and, and this is an incremental step. We're opening up a lot of things on the business side. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking in the very near future about how we continue to uh, look at the number of people that, that can gather and how they can gather, but we need to understand that uh, settings that bring lots of people together, especially in social kind of environments, carry their own unique risk, and we have to be very careful in that area. Alicia, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, there's a report out of Ontario where the military has been raising concerns about COVID-19 patients who are sharing rooms with those who are um, un uninfected. And I know that this is something that happened at Northwood. So I'm wondering if you kind of stand by what happened at Northwood, allowing them to share rooms. And if this is something that might be addressed, should we have a second wave? So I, I know Northwood uh, was um, uh, well aware of uh, they they were separating people as much as they were able to within their uh, within their uh, kind of infrastructure and as 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 uh, people were moved uh, people who had recovered were moved uh, into a, off site into another temporary facility uh, and there were other changes they were they were able to ex separate people uh, even more so they, I think they they did what was they were able to do and what was appropriate given the the infrastructure that they had. Uh, we have to acknowledge that also that many of the infection control things were, were in place even though people were, were living in, in, in shared rooms and there were infection control steps in place. Next question will go to CTV's Natasha Pace. Thank you. I'm um, just following up to Alicia's question and the report out of Ontario. Um, I'm wondering if that makes either the Premier or Dr. Strang uh, feel the need that there should be an inquiry into what happened at Northwood. 
So, uh, first of all, let me just say thank you to all the long-term care facilities across our province. We have over 130 long-term care facilities uh, done a tremendous job of ensuring uh, that COVID-19, if it came into the facility, was isolated, uh, uh, treated. Uh, what's happened here at Northwood, obviously, as we said, coming in, uh, asymptomatic people were bringing it in unknowingly uh, when the virus get into the facility. Uh, it, it began to spread through, uh, through the facility. Uh, we'll have a review of that. Uh, with all of our partners, continue to look at lessons learned. Uh, one of the previous questions about uh, uh, people living in, in uh, double rooms is something that as a Department of Health we've looked at across the sector, as particularly as we've been redeveloping uh, footprints, uh, when, whether it's a rebuild or a redesign. Uh, but we'll enter into conversations with Northwood and, and quite frankly, those families who uh, had experience in Northwood, all of whom, uh, by and large, have come up with a positive of impression of the care that their loved one was receiving. Uh, but we will, uh, as I believe will happen across the country, there will be a review, particularly of those uh, larger facilities uh, that have a number of residents in one spot. Natasha, do you have a follow-up? I do. So I just wanted to be clear that um, a review would obviously be different than a public inquiry, and there are still growing calls for a public inquiry. So at this point in time, there's no plans for that, correct? Uh, we're still working to ensure that we deal with the issue at Northwood, uh, continue to make sure that those who call Northwood home, uh, who are active, get treated, and uh, those that have been taken out of the home who are looking to go home, uh, make sure that we do that in a safe manner, uh, and we'll work with uh, all of our partners to see what the appropriate mechanism is and uh, what are the changing protocols will be as we go forward. Next question, we'll go to Keith Doucette with Canadian Press. Good afternoon, Premier. I'm just wondering about the two big announcements for um, for uh, infrastructure. Whether is that new money? I'm not quite clear on that. And if it's not, where did you find the funds to be able to put, to to do those two programs? So uh, the, uh, the there's two. For number one, the grant, are you referring to the grant program? Yeah, one's the grant program for business. The other one's the 230 million for uh, infrastructure. Okay, so the grant program uh, is not uh, new money. It's money that we had set aside at Dalhousie. Uh, the two previous programs that we have, uh, there was money left over in those, as well as, as you know, we had an additional five million dollars. So we combined uh, the money that we had set aside uh, to uh, into this new fund to help uh, people reopen and restart, and it's a grant program. Uh, the reason that there was funding left from the previous uh, two programs, uh, the federal government uh, got out quite, quite frankly, uh, quickly with uh, the funding that they required to support individuals who were, uh, who either were self-employed or didn't have enough hours for EI, who we thought would use up about 20 million of that. Uh, so there was money left over in both of those earlier programs. Uh, and the $230 million is a capital investment that the province will uh, make uh, and it's new funding. Uh, what we do, as you know, have a five-year capital plan in Nova Scotia. Uh, these projects that we would pull up will be ones that uh, would have been on that five-year plan in eight years. And it is really to try to make sure that we spread economic opportunity across the province uh, for infrastructure that government needs, uh, at the same time making investments in infrastructure that will allow us to uh, take build on that infrastructure for next year. For example, some of our museums uh, will be making uh, strategic investments in some of those for the tourism season next year to attract people. Our waterfront uh, investments will be very similar, uh, either either uh, removing some infrastructure or, or, or physical barriers that are there or adding to and improving uh, our waterfronts so that when we hit the tourism season next year, uh, we will be able to uh, build off of that investment by Nova Scotians. Keith, do you have a follow-up? Yes, for Dr. Strang, um, you briefly mentioned uh, smaller businesses and smaller restaurants in terms of capacity and what you may require of them. I'm wondering about larger businesses, larger restaurants, and whether there's going to be any set number in terms of capacity. I mean, obviously, they're going to be able to accommodate more people if they adhere to the rules for distancing. But do you, but are there any numbers there, like 50% of capacity, 60% of capacity, and how would you check that? So the, the this first step in the opening, uh, and then it was in the proposal, and, and we support that proposal, is that restaurants would open to a maximum of their 50% uh, capacity, knowing that they always have to have limit their numbers so they can maintain that uh, distance of six feet or more between 
between tables. Uh, and if they can do that, they, if they have enough space, they can get up to 50% of their cat capacity. Uh, we've also put a limit, you know, uh, that uh, that they can have uh, uh, the the, uh, the number of people that are allowed to gather for a social gathering, which today is five. That is that when they open, uh, they'll have to respect whatever the number is for that uh, that group number uh, on June 5th. That's the that's the maximum number of people in a in a party that could uh, that could come and sit at one table. Next question will go to Mike Gorman with CBC. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Premier, sorry, I need a little more clarity on the infrastructure program. I'm not clear on whether the tenders that you're announcing today, is this part of the $1 billion capital plan that was announced earlier this year, or are you doing this on top of that $1 billion, which I guess would now effectively make the capital plan uh, $1.2 billion? Yeah, so it is, uh, no, it is, it is, so the uh, capital plan, uh, this announcement would be on top of our capital plan that we announced, uh, uh, the Minister of Finance announced, uh, and it is projects that were on uh, the five-year capital plan. Some of it is highways, and as I said earlier, some of it is actual infrastructure, uh, museums, uh, some of our museums invested, hopefully to bring tourism, uh, same with our waterfronts, those kinds of investments. And then uh, we've been able to and will have to repair some of government infrastructure, uh, school roofs, uh, some investments in healthcare that w were not part of the uh, larger uh, investment that we've made. Mike, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, about eight, but I guess um, I'm, I'm only gonna get one. Um, uh, Dr. Strang, can you talk to me, please, about, uh, you may, obviously you've been meeting with all of these associations and, and working on them with their plans, and at some point you said to them, you're good to go, and, and to the point where the Premier can announce the date that he has today. I, I, perhaps I'd like to hear from both of you on this, but how confident are you that this information has been shared with people who work within all these industries to give them sufficient time to get adequate PPE, to make the necessary alterations they need in their shops so that they can actually open on June 5th. And do you have any concerns, Premier, that these restrictions in place, which obviously have to be there, may be such that they limit the ability for these businesses to actually turn any profit, even though they're now allowed to reopen? So um, we've been working with the, the 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 association. So I'll use the restaurants as an example with uh, a Restaurant Association of Nova Scotia and Restaurants Canada, the, the Atlantic Division. They are the ones that had brought forward a, a well-developed proposal, um, and, and they had been working with all their members. So it, it's it's not new to them. Uh, and we've been going back and forth and in, in making some you know, recommendations on some changes in some areas. And uh, you know, today we were able to give them a, a formal. Uh, approval, uh, knowing today's uh, around today's announcement, but uh, it's not that the, it's so. It's but it's no surprise that 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 of well, the contents of what the, their proposal was. So uh, um, um, it's really at the end of the day that it, it, it is ever does that. How of those associations have been communicating with their members and informing their members about uh, uh, about starting to prepare, uh, and, and and they've had lots of time uh, to do that. So we continue to work with it in, in that. At that sector by sector approach, uh, and and we have been giving guidance, but ultimately each of the sectors have uh, had need to work with their members uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, you know work out the details. Um, but much of what we've been saying it should not come as a surprise to anybody about how they have to accommodate uh, certain public health uh, requirements as they as they start to develop a detailed opening plans. And, and uh, to your question, Mike, there's no question, uh, you know, businesses are opening under under different protocols. Uh, this will impact uh, them, but they've been very clear, and their associations uh, have been very clear. Uh, they're ready to open. They're prepared to follow public health protocols uh, and do everything they can to be innovative and creative uh, to ensure that they can weather this, keep their employees uh, employed uh, at the same time as we work towards ensuring that we don't get another spike with COVID and uh, we work towards ensuring that we can keep COVID, uh, how do we live with COVID and what are the changes that we can make at a future date uh, that begins to help them continue to make a profit. Next question will go to Lindsay Armstrong with All Nova Scotia. Thank you. Um, Premier, the Prime Minister said he's consulting with the provinces on mandatory sick days. How do you feel about the proposal and how far along are those discussions? 
Well, I, I've been very clear uh, that uh, that's a collective bargaining process. Uh, you can have it at the uh, at the bargaining table. As you know, many people here in our province already have sick days in the public sector. What I have said and what I'll continue to say that I believe the national government can, through its unemployment insurance program, ensure that if someone needs to be tested for COVID, can give them that test period, whether it's three or four days required to go get the test and wait for the results to come back, uh, that the federal government can do that through its insurance uh, program. Uh, and that would be a good first step uh, as uh, both private and public uh, uh, entities uh, negotiate it. Uh, the 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 uh, sick benefit uh, throughout the collective bargaining process. Lindsay, do you have a follow up? Yes, thank you, uh, for Dr. Strang. You said that some businesses listed for June uh, reopening haven't yet submitted plans. Are those businesses without plans not allowed to open on June fifth? And which sectors haven't yet submitted proposals that have been approved? So we've got a number of uh, proposals that in the, just in the last 24 hours have been coming in from a, a number of the regulated uh, health professions. Uh, I've got a several. I've got we've got one that's coming in that I, ha I haven't had a chance to look at yet today from uh, the body art folks. Um, so they continue to come in, but yeah, as we're as we're redrafting uh, the order, uh, there is a requirement that uh, that all the businesses that have been closed down that there has to be a, a plan in place that is approved. Uh, before they can actually reopen. So we're working with them, uh, 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 you know, very urgently. Uh, I know that a lot of people, uh, my colleagues in, in, in government, have been uh, working very long hours this week uh, and expect to work long hours the next few days supporting uh, and moving our proposals through to get them approved. At the end of the day, there are some sectors that haven't had proposals in yet. It's their obligation to do the work to get us the proposals. We'll turn those around as quickly as we can once we get them. Next question will go to Olivier Lafarve with Radio Canada. Thank you. Uh, my question is for uh, the Premier, um, Stephen McNeil. Um, let me find it here. Sorry. Uh, I'm wondering how the province could help uh, more small businesses like restaurants uh, who are struggling to pay their rent but uh, because their landlord refused to apply the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance, so they can benefit of the 75% relief and still have to pay 100% of their rent. So first of all, we're, as you know, that program just opened up uh, uh, two days ago uh, for Nova Scotia. We're looking at that, monitoring it uh, about... Uh, uh, who has registered, uh, if there are issues associated with it, uh, why they haven't registered. Uh, we believe this is a good program. It's, we're, it's one of the programs that puts us all in this together. Uh, the commercial uh, uh, landlord uh, needs to take a role in ensuring that our businesses stay afloat. Uh, the individual business would pay, as well as both the provincial and federal government would uh, be part of that. So we think it's a good program. On top of that, we have uh, an additional uh, de rent deferral program in our province that a number of businesses have have already uh, taken us up on. And today I announced a uh, business reopening grant and that $5,000 uh, for an individual business uh, can be used for whatever they choose to use it for as part of the reopening. It could be part rent or it could be buying supplies or uh, whatever it is that they believe they require to help them get started. Olivier, do you have a follow-up? Sure, thank you. Um, Following uh, Natasha Pay's question on uh, public inquiry, uh, Northwood is not the only example in Canada where there was a lot of cases uh, of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities. So I'm wondering, uh, Premier, if uh, Nova Scotia would be in favour of a national public inquiry on long-term care facilities. Well, the federal government has acknowledged uh, the issue on long-term care and the role it wanted to play. Uh, there's been ongoing uh, conversations. I've been listening to what's happening in Ontario and Quebec today. Uh, again, I want to thank all of those who've been working at Northwood to continue to isolate uh, and control that virus. There's no question, though, there's been a lot of heartache. Uh, we know how the virus get in. We know how the virus uh, spread. Uh, we now need to look at how do we prevent that into the future? What are the protocols and steps we need to take? Uh, but I would certainly welcome a national conversation about, uh, about health care and long-term care. 
Uh, when uh, the funding of healthcare started, uh, it was 50-50 between provinces and and, ter- and between provinces and, and the federal government and territories. Uh, today, uh, the federal contribution to Nova Scotia is less than 20 uh, 20 percent, uh, and we would welcome a conversation about long-term care and particularly around the capital infrastructure investments required uh, to continue to build uh, new modern facilities. Uh, but I, I do want to say, uh, in, as this conversation continues to go on, I want to continue to uh, voice my uh, uh, support uh, for the men and women who have been working at Northwood, providing the care uh, to their loved ones. And I've been inspired and impressed, uh, quite frankly, by the family members who've had people there who actually uh, succumbed to this virus, uh, the words that they spoke about and how they very much appreciated the care their loved one had received at Northwood. Uh, and I want to uh, tell them how much it's been inspiring and really uh, positive for our province to have their voices heard uh, and to have their, their loved one's story told. Uh, not only their life in Northwood, but quite frankly, their, their enormous life uh, inside of uh, the building of this great country. Next question, we'll go to Kyle Shaw with The Coast. Hi. Um, I think this is for the Premier, but you guys can decide. Uh, now that we're on the brink of reopening, is there any need to extend the state of emergency when it expires this Sunday? So uh, that uh, we're looking at that. Uh, there are certain parts that will be required to have uh, the state of emergency continue to uh, to be extended beyond uh, Sunday. Uh, as you know, uh, there are still uh, you're unable to hold huge uh, gatherings. Uh, uh, so uh, there are some uh, legislative requirements for uh, businesses to have annual meetings. Uh, those things have to be done uh, uh, f- virtually now. Uh, so the state of emergency be required to do that. Uh, there are some other aspects of uh, of daily lives in our province that that uh, state of emergency will continue to be required. Well, one of them is, uh, quite frankly, that uh, commercial landlords cannot evict. Uh, their tenants uh, during this period of time, and as one of your previous quest- one of your previous questions before you was talking about uh, the, the lack of take up when it comes to commercial uh, uh, developers uh, around the rent deferral uh, in uh, from the Canadian government and provincial government. Uh, our emergency order prevents any evictions uh, at this time. Kyle, do you have a follow up? Yes, I do. Uh, this is for Dr. Strang. Um, you recently mentioned that we should bear in mind whether someone is at a higher risk of a severe outcome from COVID before we include them in, a, in an immediate family bubble. So do you think that being at higher risk should be taken into account as other parts of society reopen? Like, are there plans to ask higher risk teachers to continue working from home when classrooms reopen? Or, or should the higher risk people think twice before going into a busier place like a mall? So I think there, there's uh, uh, there's certainly an, a, a number of levels that individuals need to understand uh, what their particular risk of, a, of, of severe disease uh, and severe outcome. But you also have to understand that uh, that uh, across all ages, uh, other than uh, very rare severe outcomes in children, but uh, even even young healthy adults, there's a, there is some risk of severe outcome. So people need to factor that in. The older you are, the more number of chronic conditions. Uh, um, that the kind of choices you make and what risk you put yourself at are important. Uh, and, and, you know, as, as, as various businesses, organizations, uh, 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 cor- you know, adjust to the new norm around COVID-19, how do they, how do they factor that in? So, yeah, maybe the, the people who are at higher risk aren't sort of on the front line in, in, in a retail outlet when they're exposed to lots of people. Maybe they have a different type of job that doesn't, doesn't have the, the, the same level of exposure. Um, a lot of these things, you know, government can't create rules around, but everybody from an individual level upwards needs to think about how we uh, factor in uh, the, uh, the, ty- the individual risks around uh, health and uh, age uh, and how those uh, play into decisions that we make around, uh, uh, you know, finding that balance between having an uh, opening society in the economy, but at the same time respecting the need to control COVID-19. Next question, we'll go to Tim Biscay with the Halifax Examiner. Hi, thank you. Um, judging by my Twitter feed right now, there's an awful lot of confusion um, as to the, the parameters and protocols and how things are going to reopen. So I, I'm wondering if, um, if you can just address some of that. For example, um, 
the the orders or the press release that I just received doesn't mention kind of public facilities like libraries, theaters, those sort of things. Um, it, will there be music allowed at the local tavern? Um, it seems to be that there's a limit of five in my house, but I can go meet someone that's not in my family bubble um, at a at a at a restaurant and sit down with them, so long as we're fewer than than five. W- will there be more detailed clarification about these sort of issues? So a lot of that that work is uh, is. Um and working with the various associations, but you know, so we're instead we're working with the restaurant association about uh, them having up on their website and how they're communicating to the public. Uh, you've mentioned restaurants. We there is a there a part of the public health order remains that people need to respect social distancing outside of their household bubble and their and or their household or their household bubble. So actually, you if you go to a restaurant with somebody who's not in those uh, not in either in your household or household bubble, you actually have to sit down so you're maintaining. Uh, social distancing that's not new uh that's in the public that's in the order uh so people need to be understand what what the requirements are and that infor- we have a lot of that information on, on our uh, coronavirus website and there as i said in my in my remarks there's a whole new uh, website up and going with lots of information around businesses uh and but as i said we all we continue to work we will work with all the various businesses their associations uh it's not just government's responsibility to to make make things clear we're working with them to so and, and ultimately uh, individual businesses to provide clarity uh, to uh, consumers and the public Tim do you have a follow-up yeah I do um, I, I guess this, this is the same sort of set of question it, it, it's unclear to me and maybe you've addressed this but it seems to have been contradictory a couple of times is the goal here um, eliminating the, the disease keeping it to a minimum spread um, it, I guess the context here is the premier has talked um, about funding programs to get ready for next uh, next year's tourism season, and of course the work is is welcome uh, for people who are unemployed. But um, how do we get to tourism season um, when there's not a vaccine for the disease, and people, especially in the United States, which is the base of our our uh, tourism economy, are seem to be going hog wild with it. Um, I guess I'm asking, how does this on, on, how do we get to the end of this? I think as we've said all along, uh, this is about living with COVID for some time. It's why uh, Dr. Strang has continued to talk about the public health protocols and continuing to follow them. Uh, they're pretty straightforward, uh, six feet apart, uh, staying within your unit, uh, uh, lots of uh, p- uh, personal hygiene, washing hands regularly. Uh, and as we begin to open up our economy, we have uh, Nova Scotians that have done a tremendous job of working together to continue to flatten the curve and almost uh, keep the virus at bay for a period of time. Uh, And what we want to see is there's a second wave uh, that we don't end up with the entire shutdown of our economy because we've now done the work to prevent the spread, uh, which means that we can still operate and we don't get the spike uh, that we received in wave one. And that's the principle behind why we waited, why we've gone slower than some provinces. It's the principle behind why we've worked with associations to be able to go out and communicate a mass message to their members. Uh, Because everyone needs to continue to recognize that as we uh, open this up, it will be different. Uh, Those uh, public health protocols that will be required will need to be followed. And as we look through this year and into next year, uh, I mean, all of us globally want to see a vaccine. Uh, If it's not there, we will need to continue to look at parts of our economy uh, around tourism, for example. What are the things that we can do that allows, uh, you know, the the family bubble, uh, the the, the self-distancing part to continue to operate? Some tourism operators will continue to do that throughout this year. Uh, What we're saying is, though, that in the issue around our public investment was we wanted to make sure on behalf of taxpayers that if we were spending this money, uh, it was going to be spent in assets that, first of all, were for the public good. And second of all, that uh, when that asset is completed, it's a piece, it's something we can build on. It's an attraction. It's that will bring people into a particular part of our province in future years. Uh, And quite frankly, it won't just be next. It'll be for decades to come. Next question will go to Bill Martin with Six Rivers News. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, do I understand correctly, Dr. Strang, that a uh, 100-seat restaurant that has the capacity to uh, provide social distancing 
can in fact uh, accommodate 50 patrons. And if that's true, why would it not also apply to, say, a 100-seat church allowing 50 worshipers? So again, I come back to that. We have to understand it's just not about it's not just numbers. It's the type of activity that goes on, uh, that uh, and, and and the type of potential for close contact. So social, a whole range of kind of social gatherings are, are are different than than the restaurant piece. There's a there's an economic piece around the restaurant as well. We're, we'll get there, but we're we'll be talking soon about how we uh, uh, open up on on the the social gathering side of things as well. But it's important that people understand that this is the first step. We have to have a, uh, continue to go slowly and carefully in this. Uh, we, we've, we've opened up a large part of our society by the announcements today that inherently does inject some level, increased level of risk of COVID-19, that we, and we continue with our surveillance programs. So we have to, uh, we have to take various steps at, at, at different times to make sure we're, we're, taking, we're introducing the right level of risk that we, that we were able to manage, and then we monitor that, and, and if things continue to progress, then we can can, when we can expand uh, on things like numbers, uh, et cetera, that uh, that, uh, that that facilitate uh, you know broader broader uh, broader ability of whether it's social gatherings or, or, or activities that can happen in businesses. This is, we can't do this all at once. Uh, it's a careful, thoughtful process. Bill, do you have a follow up? Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. String. You were already asked about uh, when you might be able to relax the five maximum number. I'd like to uh, take it a different tact and say, what conditions do you want that need to be met to make that allowed? So we, 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 it's all based on uh, on looking at the epidemiology uh, and then what what risk are we uh, able to take on by by doing that uh, and then and part of that is making sure we have the consultation. One of the previous questions was around museums and libraries. I just just yesterday had a conversation with uh, with that sector and we continue to have discussions uh, through the Department of Community Cultures and Heritage with the sport community, with the recreation community, with our with our uh, kind of cultural community. Uh, so there's a lot of ongoing work that we need to get through to, to, at the end of the day as we open up these other spaces, perhaps increase the number of people that can be allowed, that, 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 the, the, that the operators of those spaces know how to do that safely. And that's all the time that we have for questions today. Uh, thank you, Christine. For all of you out there that are getting ready uh, for reopening, June 5th may seem exciting. For some of you, it may also be a little bit scary. And I don't want you to worry. If you're not ready, you do not have to open on June 5th. Go at your own pace, and safety should be paramount, not only of your employees and you, but also of your customers. I have great faith in Dr. Strang and public health. I have faith in your associations who have brought forward some very solid plans. And I have faith in all of you. Many of you are doing it already, and by all accounts, it is going well. I've noticed some businesses preparing patios with tables six feet apart. We are among one of the last provinces to restart, and quite frankly, I'm okay with that because we have to get it right, and there are no guarantees, but this approach is our best chance. So you still have time to prepare. You should have time to, and you still have time to ask lots of questions. Don't forget our website, Reopening Nova Scotia. There's lots of information there and numbers that you can call. We will have more to say on Friday about the growing, opening up our economy and social gatherings. And you may feel alone, but you're not. We are all in this together as we have been from the beginning. Let's not, let's not now separate. Let's make sure we stay united on our journey to continuing to rebuild our province.